Next topic. What? Got to fix the camera. Sorry. Next topic is going to be... There we go. Is that better? Yeah. Uh, next topic is how do... Well, okay, let me talk to you about it. Uh, we've had a number of times when it's come up that it's important to us to understand agents' expectations in this model. Uh, that the given that exchange rates are being driven by financial capital flows, and given that the primary factor with the financial capital flow is the expectation of future profit, those expectations are really important to understand. And we talked about some stuff. Let's see, back before exam one, we had the uh, availability and, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, representativeness and anchoring and Keynes's views and so forth. Uh, and then the very last example we did with the four quadrant diagram was one in which agents' expectations suddenly adjusted there in the top left, which caused all the other events. All right, So the agent suddenly decided, hey, I think something else is going to happen instead. So agents' expectations can have an impact on the uh, currency market obviously because they are the ones that are creating the outcomes uh, and their expectations are driving their decision making. Um, so it'd be nice to have a little bit of a more specific view of what their, not just the characteristics of their view uh, of their forecast like the anchoring, the representatives and so forth, but an actual model of the sort of things they would be thinking about and how that feeds into the exchange rate forecast. So that's the next big topic. Uh, and let me tell you first of all, that I read this from an article by a guy named Stefan Schulmeister some years ago. Man, it was awesome. Uh, it really set me on the road. You know, I said at one point during these videos that I was looking for something that was more realistic, it seemed to me, than the neoclassical view, which leaned heavily uh, on the idea that it was trade flows that were driving exchange rates. Well, they're not. Uh, so I wanted to find somebody that was talking about what I thought was the real world. And when I came across the Stefan Schulmeister thing, that, that was a huge revelation to me. He's also a really nice guy. Yeah, I got to meet him later. Um, now, uh, he worked at the Austrian Institute for something or other, by which it means the country of Austria, not the school of thought. And one of the things he pointed out in his article was that dealers are always maintaining simultaneously two sets of expectations, all right? Uh, and I really found this to be illuminating when I would then go on to read actual accounts of currency market events later that this really jumped out at me once he had raised, uh, raised my attention to it. And what he's talking about is there's a difference between how I think a football team is going to do next week versus how I think they're going to do on the season. How I think the currency is going to move next week over how I think that that currency is going to move in general over the course of the next month or so, you know, several months. Um, and that made so much sense to me. That this here is a lens or, or, or a bias uh, that occurs when you as the currency dealer are looking at economic data or you know, political data or whatever it is. Uh, for example, let's say that right now you have a very strong pro-dollar view as far as its general strength, all right? But you can still think, ah, I think it's going to fall next week, though. Uh, I, I think that based on the um, unemployment data that are going to come out, I, don't, I think they're going to disappoint expectations, and so I think they're going to fall. But I think in general, the dollar's in a really good place. And so, so, so that's kind of a, a, a description of, of, of how this would manifest itself in the mind of a currency dealer. You've got this sort of general sense of strength. Uh, or weakness, of course, uh, and then what's going to happen over the course of the week. And, you know, if you think that a football team in the National Football League is really good and that they might win the Super Bowl, that doesn't mean you think they're going to win every game. Uh, then only one team in history has won every game of the season and uh, then gone on to win the Super Bowl. So um, there's a difference between thinking that the uh, Minnesota Vikings 
or a really strong team and thinking that they're going to win next week. All right. Uh, now, as they begin to lose, at first you write it off. Well, I mean, you know, that's some bad luck this week. And, or they were playing a, a, a Bears team that was really on the rise this week. Um, but if they keep losing, eventually the short-run outcomes are going to cause you to shift your medium-term view. All right? But, nevertheless, well, the important thing here is not that this can't move. Of course it can. It can shift over time. Uh, how, how the market is viewing various currencies, whether or not it is pro or anti-dollar or euro or whatever, uh, that'll shift over time. But, in the uh, short run, when it hasn't shifted yet, it's fascinating the way this works. If you have a pro-dollar bias, then as you're you know, reading your computer screen or whatever for news about the U.S., what you will tend to do is you will discount anti-dollar news and magnify pro-dollar news. I mean, think about it. It's logical, isn't it? Uh, if you think some football team's really good and they win this week, you're like, told you. I, I knew that was going to happen, and that just, that, that, that just strengthens my feeling that this is a good football team. Whereas when they lose, oh, well, I mean, you know, uh, it was a fluke. Uh, and in fact, you will see incidents in the currency market and in the stock market where the dealers will totally ignore bad news. And we'll talk about this on the, thir uh, on the last third of the course, uh, specific historical events that have happened with the dollar, uh, dollar currency price. And so if you're pro-dollar, you will discount anti-dollar news to the point that you might actually totally ignore it. Again, we're going to have some examples of that later on. Whereas stuff that's pro-dollar that comes out, you're like, I knew it. And the impact of this information will be stronger when this is your lens, when this is your bias, than the impact of this kind of information. And of course, the, the opposite is true. If the market is really anti-dollar right now, which was the case after the collapse of the Bretton Woods system in 1973, then there were actually a number of very positive events that took place for the U.S. They were ignored. Uh, the market ignored them. Uh, and, and instead, ironically focused on things that were weird negative side effects of the positive things. Yeah, I know you won the lottery, but uh, now you're going to have a tough time figuring out how you're going to spend that money. That seems bad to me. All right, so uh, that sort of thing. So this medium-term expectational bias, and, and it talks about it in, in, in the book, of course, uh, a sort of lens through which agents filter inputs. Though actors may have a specific level of the exchange rate in mind when forming medium-term expectations, it's best thought of as taking one of three values with respect to a particular currency. Bullish, pro the currency in question. Bearish, anti the currency in question. Or neutral. When medium-term expectations are bullish, like I did my example here, pro-dollar, the significance of events that would lead to appreciation is magnified, and that of those that would end in depreciation is discounted. Bearishness has an analogous impact, while neutrality means that no particular attractor exists. So, um, that's the first thing I want to tell you is, when we're sitting here talking about agents' expectations, it's important to, first of all, distinguish in the fact that there are short-term expectations, you know, like over the next several days, the next week, and then medium term, over the next several weeks uh, to months. And there's no calendar time set on these, by the way. Uh, it, 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 it's obviously going to vary uh, from circumstance to circumstance, but it is nevertheless clear that this exists as something unique from this. And I will also say that as information on this accumulates that is in, contra that is in contradiction to the overall bias, this will shift. So short-run news is going to eventually cause this to shift. Right? You know, the, 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 the Vikings keep losing over and over and over. You know what? Actually, maybe they suck. All right, so. That's the first thing I want to tell you about agents' expectations and getting a little bit more specific about the mechanics uh, of them. Now, if you think about it, in the stock market and in the currency market, given that the prices are simply the outcome of the collective expectations of the market participants, it doesn't really matter what they focus on. I mean, they, they could think that... Um, the prettiest picture on the currency is the one that should be the most valuable. And if that's what they think, and they're the market participants, and they're the ones buying and selling and creating the profits, then that's what's going to be important. But that's not the way it works. 
they do have a, a uh, general sense that, hey, look, what are the three reasons for someone to buy foreign currency? Either they want to buy foreign goods and services, they want to undertake foreign uh, financial investment or foreign direct investment, which we haven't talked about yet. And I don't want to bring that up here in just a minute. So another thing to bear in mind with agents' expectations is, well, they're well aware of what money is used for. They're well aware of, of this sort of practical economic theory underlying exchange rate theory in the sense that, well, what I should be paying attention to as a currency dealer is things that affect international trade, um, financial investment across borders, and direct foreign investment across borders. Again, I'll, I'll cover that in just a moment. Now, I think I'll save that until later. The last thing I want to tell you here before I start drawing the diagram is that what are the big factors they tend to look at, all right? Uh, it varies over time, uh, and, and you know, as with anything like this, um, it, it's going to be you know varying levels of, of um, uh, what, what's the word I'm after here uh, focus, but basically speaking, according to surveys that have been done of currency dealers, what do you pay attention to? What do you not pay attention to? And the result of empirical studies, empirical studies that have plugged in these variables as explanatory variables have worked very well. So, uh, probably first, uh, fumble, probably first in most, and it's purple like the Minnesota Vikings. Um, probably the most important, well, I don't even think say probably, interest rates. The number one thing that you're going to be paying attention to as a currency dealer, interest rates, because that represents free money. Uh, remember, if I buy pounds, I'm going to buy a pound um, denominated interest bearing assets, what I'm going to buy. Uh, because I'm not just going to hold pounds, I'm going to hold something that, that, that earns a return. I could buy a stock index, but stocks are much more complicated. There's really, given how much exchange rates fluctuate anyway, I don't need to be buying individual stocks in other countries. Um, I, if I'm betting on the pound depreciating, I'm better off just buying a, a, a very generic pound financial asset that bears interest. Second, unemployment. So far as we can tell, unemployment is the second most important thing that they pay a lot of attention to in the currency market. Now, by the way, there's a lot of things that are related to unemployment. GDP growth figures are related to unemployment. When, when GDP, as you saw uh, before the first exam, when GDP goes up, unemployment goes down. So there's a correlation there. But how often do unemployment figures come out versus GDP? GDP is only once a quarter. Unemployment's monthly, and in fact, it's a little bit more than monthly in the sense that there are also other indicators like uh, uh, unemployment claims that will come out uh, in the interim. So you get more more signals with this than you do with just GDP. Third, net exports, and this is a, an interesting one because sometimes the market totally ignores net exports. They couldn't care less if the U.S. has a massive trade deficit or a massive trade surplus. They're not really paying any attention to that. They're zooming in on these two right here. Other times, all of a sudden, this will become important to them. We'll, we'll, we'll see all this in the last third of the course where I go over the history of the dollar. And then last, here's another one that's kind of interesting because it's changed over time. Inflation used to be a really big deal, something that they paid attention to. And in a very different context. But over time, it's become less important, especially because there hadn't been a whole lot of inflation. But if we had to make a list, if we had to make a list of what is it that current dealers pay attention to when they are forming their forecast during the day, the forecast that then leads them to decide to buy or sell particular currencies, what are the variables they're looking at in particular? And when they look at political news, they're looking for signals about what variables. And generally speaking, it's this list right here. And in fact, um, that's what I'm going to include. Yeah, and that's what's included in this diagram, those four things, plus something else that I kind of regret putting in there now, but it's too late because the book came out 10 years ago. But, uh, I mean, it's not terrible, but I, I wish I'd done something different. Okay, uh, this is in the book, this diagram, 
All right, so um, I, I mentioned that because uh, as I start to draw this, I'm going to start from the right and work my way back to the left. Uh, and so if you're worried about, well, okay, let me do this. If you're trying to jot all this down yourself right now, which is a very good idea, I'm going to be starting at that one that seems to sit out there by itself on the right, FX forecast. I'm starting there. And then I'm going to work my way back to the left. Then I'm going to work my way to the right. And I promise you that uh, it's not that complicated. It turns out to be not that difficult to remember. If, if this is a semester without COVID and you're going to have an exam on it, people rarely miss hardly anything on this when I say draw the mental, mark, mar, uh, mental model diagram. This is the mental model. This is the model people have in their heads. This is an attempt to summarize what are dealers thinking about and what are the thought processes. All right? Not just the characteristics, but some specifics about what they're doing. Okay, so way out here we've got dollar per FX forecast. And that's what we're really after here. We're really after how are they coming up with their forecast. So uh, what's their forecast for the dollars per you know, unit of the foreign currency that we're talking about here? Uh, there are three, remember I told you earlier, there are three basic reasons why somebody will buy foreign currency. And it's going to take me a moment to explain some of these, but one is, and let's do all this from, from the perspective of the United States. International trade, direct foreign investment, financial investment. Those are the three reasons why. I'm sitting here at my currency desk, and uh, in the back of my mind is the fact that the reasons people buy currency are really only three. They want to buy a foreign good or service. They want to establish a multinational subsidiary. They want to build a factory in another country. Or they want to buy stock in another country, or, or a you know, government bond or whatever. Those are the three things that are in my head. And of course, of all those, this is the biggest one. In terms of volume, this is by far the biggest. And, and, and furthermore, I'm not going to base my forecast on what's already happened in these areas. Uh, hang on, John. Let, let me do a bit, bit more of an explanation before I go on about that. All right, so, so here's net exports for the United States. I told you that on the list of things that are important, it's third, but it, it's on the list. All right. Net export for the United States. That's going to feed into my forecast. When, when, when data come out on the U.S. trade deficit, sometimes I'm going to think that's particularly important, sometimes I'm not, but it is one of the things on the list. Uh, this is financial investment. This is the big one. This is buying stock. This is the capital inflows and the capital outflows. So this is like 90% of the market down here. Um, that's when we buy financial assets in another country. Uh, let me explain DFI for a second. Direct foreign investment essentially is when you're not going to buy a share of, autom of an automobile company in Japan, you're going to build an automobile company in Japan. All right. So when you build a franchise in another country, that's direct foreign investment as opposed to portfolio foreign investment or also called indirect foreign investment. But direct foreign investment is when you're establishing another one of your franchises uh, or uh, something in your supply chain in another country. Uh, that's what direct foreign investment is. So I'm going to say a little bit more about that in just a minute. All right. Now, let's see. You are sitting at your desk and trying to come up with your forecast. And you're not going to do anything until you see the latest data on U.S. imports and exports. No. You're not just forecasting this, you're also forecasting this. That's expected. Uh, you are trying to make a forecast of what you think the latest data are going to say about the U.S. trade balance before the data come out. When, once the data come out, it's kind of too late. It's like, it's like waiting until the football game is over and then placing a bet. They, they don't let you do that, right? You have to anticipate the outcome. So are you looking at actual data? Of course, from previous time periods, you're looking at actual data on U.S. trade balances. But um, as far as making your forecast this morning, 
you're trying to imagine what the numbers are right now that haven't even been published yet, which is, you know, I, I, I'm sure I'm, I'm telling you something that's very obvious to you. But I mean, that's what we do all the time in financial markets. There's going to be, oh, Friday. Uh, this is, what is today? Today is Sunday, August 9th. Friday, August 7th, was the, uh, the release by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the latest unemployment figures. And if you searched on, Friday, uh, on Thursday, August uh, I already forgot what day I said. Sixth, Fr uh, Friday, August, uh, Thursday, August sixth. You would have found lots of forecasts. There were people all over the place forecasting what they thought those numbers were going to say. Now, say you're a currency dealer. Uh, you are also. We're going to have unemployment back here somewhere in a minute, but. Um, you're going to be worried about that too, and you're not going to wait for the data to come out. You're going to try to anticipate. So all of these should have an E on them, because actually we don't have very good data on these anyway. They don't come out very often. Uh, but um, you're going to be looking at the. Uh, you're going to be trying to anticipate what these are going to be, and then that way, and use those anticipations to create your forecast. All right, let's get into it a little bit more deeply here. Um, if U.S. exports rise relative to imports, should I revise my forecast upward or downward? Or I, I'm sorry, let me word that more carefully. If I forecast that U.S. exports are going to rise relative to imports, does that forecast make me, th or does that make me think that the dollar is going to, come, going to become stronger or weaker? If I think that exports are going to go up, do I think that's going to make the dollar stronger or weaker? Well, stronger, because in order to buy American goods and services, you have to buy the dollar. So if this goes up, if I'm thinking this is going to go up, then I'm thinking the dollar is going to get stronger, which, by the way, is a negative sign between these two. These are the lines of correlation here, or causation, rather, I should say, uh, that when I believe that this is going to go up, I therefore believe that, that I therefore, in making my forecast, I revise this down. Why down? Because down is a dollar appreciation. Remember. Uh, fewer dollars per unit of FX is a dollar appreciation. So if I believe that net exports are going to rise, then I believe that the dollar is going to appreciate. So I'm pouring over these data, trying to figure out which way I think it's going to go. Uh, and I think that the U.S. is going to be successful in exporting more. So I'm thinking as far as that contribution to the forecast, I'm thinking that means a stronger dollar. Ooh, uh, let me not forget to write that down later. Uh, I, I, I'll get that. Right. Uh, let's skip down here to this one. What about uh, net portfolio investment in the United States? And by net, I mean flows in minus flows out. Same, same as here. Uh, what we sold minus what we bought. Uh, and same thing down here. What we sold minus what we bought. We sold financial assets and we bought financial assets. We sold goods and services and we bought goods and services. When we sell goods and services, people need the dollar. So when we sell them, it pushes up the value of the dollar. When we sell financial assets, people need the dollar. So it drives up the value of the dollar when we sell financial assets. So this is the net excess of sales over purchases. This is the net, therefore, excess of purchases of the dollar over us selling the dollar to get somebody else's currency. So it has the exact same impact. Since this net here is being measured the same way as this, sales of dollars minus purchases of dollars, or you know, uh, sales of American goods and services, yeah, but what do you gotta do to get American goods and services? You gotta buy dollars. Sales of American financial assets minus purchases of foreign assets. That's the same thing as saying sales of American dollars minus, purchases, m m minus um, uh, us uh, buying foreign currency. Uh, so when we increase PFI, that, or when I think it's going to happen, when I think there's going to be more uh, financial inflows, that means that more people are buying the dollar, therefore it's bidding it up. Did I say that right up here? Sales of the dollar uh, minus purchases of the dollar? No, no, no. I, I think that's what I said. Uh, no. Uh, this is sales of the dollar minus sales of, of, of uh, foreign currency. All right. So the difference between those is the net excess demand for the dollar, which of course can be a negative number, in which case it's a net excess supply of the dollar, in which case this would go up. Same deal here. It's going to be the amount of money coming into the United States to build factories here minus the money that's leaving. And, and so in other words, then, it's going to be the purchases of the dollar to build your factory in Texas 
uh, as opposed to the dollars that were supplied to the market when we wanted to build a factory in Osaka. Um, so, same deal. Uh, yeah, that's all I need to say about that. All right, so all three of those, and honestly, I'm not going to pay much attention to this. I, I included it for completeness, um, but really, I know of no, I can think of no instance in the history of the dollar. Sorry, all right, there's some ice. But that was lovely with the camera, or with the microphone so close. Um, I can think of no instances where I ever read anyone talking about a direct foreign investment. It's kind of an interesting phenomenon, so I thought I'd include it. Okay, so we are trying to forecast the future movements of the dollar by forecasting net exports, net direct foreign investment, and net portfolio financial investment. But then, of course, those are also derivative of other forecasts. And I would strongly urge you to, if you're trying to remember this, to write it out uh, in some context, to write it out exactly like I'm going to do it with price, GDP, interest rates, liquidity, because it makes the arrows that I'm about to draw simpler. By the way, another thing that, that economists sometimes do is they'll put Y minus Y star, where Y without a U.S. on it is the domestic and the one with the star is the foreign one. That, that saves a little time, too. Okay, so I'm going to have four, and in fact, I had a name for these. I called these uh, base factors, and I called these processes, although quite honestly... I usually forget that I did that, so uh, that turns out not to be terribly important. But these are the four sort of base factors that are driving these three right here. And also, again, expected, expected, expected. And I don't have an E on that, but that should be expected too. And I want to do it just like it is in the book. Um, so these are the factors that are feeding into those processes right there. And uh, for example, If we expect U.S. prices to rise faster than foreign prices, we're going to have a tough time exporting. Negative sign. We're going to have a tough time exporting if our prices are rising faster than somebody else's. So here you are, the currency dealer, trying to figure out the forecast for the dollar, which is dependent on what international trade does, which is dependent on what price levels do. Right. So you're sort of tracing this backwards here. Uh, and generally speaking, this line of causation isn't going to be that important. It's going to be this one in the end. But we need to have them all on there so we can examine situations uh, in the third part of the course that aren't typical. Um, all right. What else does price affect? Uh, I, you know, one of the things you have to be careful with drawing diagrams like this is drawing an arrow to every other element uh, and thinking to yourself, well, it could affect that. Well, yeah, 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 it could affect it, but for crying out loud, let's keep it as simple as we can. I'm going to redraw these because I, I made them too close together. So, my point being that I've only got the price one going to one other place. I'm sure I could have justified more than that, but I decided just there to net uh, exports. Now, uh, net, 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 net uh, direct foreign investment. Direct foreign investment, there are two basic varieties of direct foreign investment. And, the, and I'm just going to jot these down over here for a second. Um, vertical and horizontal. This was actually a great area of research interest for me when I first got the TCU. The very first article I ever published was on direct foreign investment, and I included a variable in my regression that was about the exchange rate, and that kind of shifted my interest over to the exchange rate. But anyway, uh, this is something I used to find really interesting. Uh, I, I don't as much now, but I, I, I did want to bring it up here. Um, the two kinds of direct foreign investment. Okay, I, I'm establishing uh, a, a venture in Brazil. Why? Do you want to sell to Brazilians? Or do you want to use their raw materials? All right, that's basically the breakdown. Are you simply filling in part of your supply chain by moving to this country? Or are you opening a Walmart in Buenos Aires? You know, that, that in this case, we are looking for your market 
as opposed to your resources. So this one is resource seeking, this one is market seeking. And um, the way I decided to represent the resource seeking was this, put a negative sign right there. As prices go up in the US, likely as not our resources are becoming more expensive, particularly labor. And so I'd rather not undertake direct foreign investment into the U.S. for that reason. Uh, that um, as, as wages and prices go up in a country, so the incentive to do vertical investment there. Now, if they got oil and you need oil, that kind of, uh, of, of trumps all that. Uh, if there's some special resource there that you can't get somewhere else. But in general, as prices rise, it's going to become less profitable for me to invest in that country. Whereas, oh, wait. Yeah, let's hold off on that. Okay. Um, now, listen, I'm done with, with price. Now I'm going to do uh, net GDP growth. And first of all, I'm going to hop over that. Uh, and as the U.S. economy grows, so imports grow relative to our trading partners. If we're, tr if, we're, if we're growing faster than our trading partners, we're getting a trade deficit with respect to our trading partners, uh, it, it, almost certain. So, sorry, it's getting a little crowded there. It, it's, it's clear in the book, um, but I've got another. By the way, almost every sign is negative. Oh, and I meant to do them all in the same color, uh, just so it'd be easier to look at. Why didn't I do them in red? Well, I'm about to. Negative, 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 negative. Okay, we'll have a couple of pluses here in a minute, but that's one of the things I always tell students when they have to remember this for the exam, is that what, are there five pluses? There are five pluses, and four of them are on top of each other, which is really, really handy that it works out that way. And it's part of why I recommend to you that you remember this the exact way I drew it out here, uh, because then that creates that, that simple um, way to remember where the negative signs are. In fact, we're, we're done with negative signs over on this side. All right. What about if your economy, so again, if your economy is growing faster than your trading partners, then your imports are growing faster than your exports, because your exports are going to grow when their economy grows, but your imports are going to grow when your economy grows. So, uh, th and so check this out. This becomes a negative factor for the dollar. If the U.S. is growing really fast, that's going to give us a bigger trade deficit, which is going to cause us to think that the dollar is going to depreciate. And so watch, if this is going up, then that's going down because we have a negative sign there. If that's going up, that's going down. And if that's going down, that's going up, which means that we're thinking that it's going to depreciate. That has actually happened a couple of times. Um, the one I can think of off the top of my head was, was after uh, in the uh, 70s, where dealers were interpreting the, remember I said with this medium term bias thing, dealers were interpreting rapid US growth as a negative because they were already very anti-dollar. Speaking of which, let me go ahead and put that up here. You're supposed to have a little cell up here somewhere for... Sort of jot down, what are the medium-term expectations? Are they pro-dollar? Are they anti-dollar? What are they? Uh, and um, to remind you that that's a major factor there in how these others will be interpreted. So when we had this strong anti-dollar bias in the 70s and the information is coming out that the U.S. economy is growing faster than everybody else, I thought that'd be kind of good, wouldn't it? But they were so anti-dollar, they're like, ah, that's going to make your trade deficit even worse because you're doing so well and buying all kinds of cool stuff. That's going to be even worse. And so it was literally interpreted as a negative for the dollar. Fascinating stuff. All right. Let's see. What about with respect to... And why is the one that has the most arrows coming out of it? This is going to have three out of it. Price is done, uh, and I tried to set this up to where it goes to these two right here, you know, so you don't have to trace an arrow all the way down to the bottom. Uh, and here's our first plus sign. Because if the U.S. is growing, it becomes a, what word am I after here? Attractive, attractive target for horizontal direct foreign investment. I want to build my grocery stores in a country where everyone has a lot of money. So if U.S. GDP growth is, uh, is rising fast, I want, my, um, I want my grocery stores there to sell my groceries to you. Uh, and so uh, when GDP rises relative to your trading partners, you would tend to attract net direct foreign investment. 
And last, it's going to feed down into this. If the U.S. economy is growing fast, would you be interested in buying their stocks and bonds? Heck yeah. All right. So the U.S. economy is growing fast relative to its trading partners. So that makes me think, oh, well, let's say, I expect the U.S. economy to grow faster than its trading partners or the you know, other alternatives around the planet. Therefore, I expect the U.S. to attract a lot of, of portfolio financial investment. Therefore, I figured the dollar is going to appreciate. So check it out. If this is going up, this is going up. And then when you hit a negative sign, you get to switch. I'm kind of thinking of this as the top of the arrow. Um, when you hit a negative sign, you get to switch the direction. When this is going up, that's going up. Whoosh, that's going down, which means a dollar a appreciation because fewer dollars per pound. All right, so that's it for why. You know what I should have done here? Let me write over top of all these. Let me just make the, the arrows a completely different color. Might make it a little easier to see everything. Because that's a whole lot of green. I don't know about you, but I find green disgusting because of what goes on in Waco. Now, let's see here. Uh, next one, we're done with Y. We're done with GDP growth. Notice it feeds into three different ones. It feeds into all three of these here. Uh, interest rates are really primarily the concern of portfolio financial investment. We could make up a reason why it's important for some of these others, but th this is the big one right here. U.S. interest rates are going up. We have every reason to expect, or, or rather, I'm sorry, I, keep, I'm, I'm, I haven't been very careful about this. Uh, if we expect U.S. interest rates to rise faster than its trading partners, or, or not just trading partners, but alternative targets for uh, financial investment, then we're figuring the U.S. is going to attract the financial investment. So therefore, we're figuring the dollar is going to appreciate. All right, so up, up, negative, negative error, or negative sign, flip the arrow, down. Or if this is down, if we expect the U.S. interest rates to fall, then down, plus sign means same direction, down, up. We expect the dollar depreciation. The last one here, and like I said, I, I, I kind of regretted some years later having included this factor separately. But eh, there are a couple of times when it comes up in, in, in the uh, successive chapters. But the more liquid we view the dollar, the more useful it is, and of course, it, you know, we could do this for a different currency, but the more useful we view it as being for undertaking uh, transactions around the planet, well, then the more people will want to buy U.S. financial assets. I mean, at the end of the day, when you have um, funds remaining as an international financial institution, and you're trying to decide, where do I want to put this money to hold it safe? We don't want to spend it right now. Uh, you know, Germany, uh, the UK, Japan, Australia, China, yeah, let's put our money in the banks of a communist dictatorship. Uh, or the U.S. The U.S. is the best target right now. The U.S. is the currency that is, oh, uh, you know, I've been teaching this for 34 years, right? Uh, and, well, what would happen if the U.S. is no longer the reserve currency? Well, it wouldn't be good. Because right now, we are able to trade dollar bills for cool stuff. People are willing to just accept the dollars because the dollars are useful to them for their savings because the dollars are so widely accepted all over the planet. Um, so if, if that wasn't true, that'd be a problem. But what do you think is going to take its place? The yuan? The Chinese currency? It's a communist dictatorship. You're thinking of where am I going to put my savings? You know, those communists seem awfully nice. Uh, so I'm going to put it there. No! Uh, the euro was a potential alternate target for many years, although even then... That's a conglomeration of a bunch of different countries, right? Um, we're one country. Obviously, there are different rates of growth and so forth in different areas. But and then after the after the Greek crisis, that that wiped the euro off uh, as as a potential competitor for the dollar. So we're pretty safe for a while, uh, unless we do something stupid. But uh, no, we don't do that. Now, let's see. Okay, so that's the basic setup so far. Uh, let me once again. You, the currency dealer, this is your target. You're trying to come up with this. This is in the back of your head causing you to interpret all of these in different ways because you are pro-dollar or anti-dollar or whatever. 
you are trying to figure out what you think relative inflation rates are going to be. What relative GDP growth rates are going to be? What relative interest rates are going to be? You know, how valuable the dollar is going to be as a, a, a form of international savings. Um, obviously, there'll be times when you're focusing more on this than anything else, and more on this than anything else, and so on. But these is your, th this is your basic roadmap right here. And so let's just take as an example, um, you have been reading the comments of Fed Chair, uh, good Lord, I quote this guy all the time, Powell, Jerome Powell. Um, and uh, you believe from what Powell said that the U.S. interest rates are going to come down. But wait. But you also believe that the uh, Bundesbank and, and you know, that the, 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 the European Central Bank is also going to lower its rates, but even more, because they're in worse shape than us. All right. So that's a net increase, actually. Uh, if they're both going to fall, but this one's going to fall more, well, actually, that's a net increase. So you think this is going to go up from what you've been you know, reading. You therefore believe that people are going to uh, buy U.S. financial assets. You therefore think the dollar is going to appreciate. I will show you next what happens from there, but I've got something to fill in right here. All right. One of the challenging things about drawing this, about coming up with this, was the fact that it is well known in neoclassical and post-Keynesian economics that currency dealers will change their minds over time, that they will go through uh, fads, that for a while this variable is really important and then it's not. Um, these are the ones that have been the most stable, so I put those on there. What do we do with the others? And also, where do we put in a speech from the Fed chair or, or, or the way that Jerome Powell tripped over uh, a, a um, uh, I was going to say a chair, but I just said the word Fed chair tripped over a table. That would be funny. Uh, you know, how do you interpret that? Where do those things come in? So what I settled on was this. Whoa, that was close. Uh, indicators. Those are the indicators. And what are those? I don't know. This set represents the evolving set of variables thought to reflect, affect, or predict the base factors and sometimes the processes themselves. So these are things that you're looking at in political news, for example, that you were using to try to interpret what may happen. To, you're not actually looking at economic data per se. You're, you're looking indirectly. And, and these are things that may be popular at one point in history, but not on another. In the 80s, uh, it was very popular for currency dealers to look at money supply growth. Now, I don't know that anybody does that at all. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit uh, before exam three. But uh, those are the sort of fads that people go through. We've gone through, let's see now, uh, I have a difficult time with, with um, uh, time because to me, 1983 was just a couple of days ago. All right, 1973, the collapse of the Bretton Woods fixed exchange rate system. Uh, so we've got 27, that's almost 50 years ago now, all right, almost 50 years ago. In the 50 years since the collapse of the Bretton Woods system, dealers have thought that this was important maybe twice, all right? So, uh, and in doing so, when they did, there were these, like, sort of, uh, uh, oh, for example, the second time they thought it was really important, this was right when I was getting my PhD, um, the twin deficits. This became a little catchphrase. The twin deficits. The budget deficit and the trade deficit and what horrible things they were going to do to the economy. So the kind of catchiness of that phrase caused a, an increase in focus on this variable right here. Just the catchiness of it. Uh, and this was, you know, where do I put twin deficits in here? Where, where do I put something like that? Well, you put it right in here. And so, as we go through what has happened in the real world, we will do just that. We will talk about unique events uh, as being part of this over here, but unique events that are somehow contributing in the mind of our of our representative currency dealer to these things over here. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Last thing. Um, once you come up with your forecast, what do you do with it? You, you know, you go to bed and you think, well, that was hard work today, uh, but I, 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 I done good. I uh, made a forecast, and uh, now I can go home. No, you take a position based on that forecast. So, let's see. Let's do this in a different color. This is, this is oh, hey, perhaps green is good here, because, I don't know, brains are kind of green, aren't they? Uh, that's the brain of the currency dealer. Now, they're going to take action. So, we're going to use horn frog purple, because horn frog purple, to me, says action.
that what I want? Yeah. And I need a negative sign right here. Now, moving from an individual currency dealer to the market as a whole, because the individual currency dealer isn't moving the market, uh, the um, aggregate expectations of all of the currency dealers is what's moving the market. That so if this is the aggregate expectation of all the currency uh, all the currency dealers and let's say in general they see the dollar as about to appreciate all right so down they think it's good they think this number is going to go down because that's an appreciation then what are they going to do flip flip the arrow they're going to invest in the US now these don't have to be American uh, investors of course these are all over the planet but when they believe the dollar is going to appreciate they're going to take positions based on that forecast. And notice there's no E on this. This isn't what's expected. This is what actually happens now. That they step in and buy U.S. financial assets, like treasury bills or deposits of money or stock indices or whatever, in order to, t to have a stake in the dollar's movement. In order to have a stake in the dollar's movement. So if they expect the dollar to, to appreciate, then there's going to be an increase in net portfolio financial investment into the United States. Now notice here I haven't bothered with any impact on, well, I'm sorry, I'm not done. And then that leads to, it's going to be the last thing on this, ooh, well, it's going to be tight here. Hey, wait a minute. Yeah, let's do that. I'm going to draw it a little bit differently than I have it in the book in terms of where I have things lined up. Oh, I did one of my schematic arrows and not the ones I was using for this. Oh, and I forgot I was using a different color for arrows. What's wrong with me? Oh, the list goes on and on. Okay, now is that on the screen? Yes. Uh, I hope so. Uh, it, it sure looks, I have a little informational thing over top of that, but there's dollars per FX at the very end. Uh, and so when they take a position in the market, it affects the price of the currency. So um, if they're expecting a dollar appreciation, there are net capital flows into the United States because we're assuming this is the aggregate set of expectations on the part of dealers. And then that causes a dollar appreciation. I want to make absolutely sure. I'm going to turn the camera just a tad that way. Uh, as I say, there's a little informational blip over top of that for me on what I'm looking at on the monitor. So I can't tell if you can see it or not. All right. So uh, there's the actual exchange rate. That's not expected. That's the actual one. So if the market participants expect a dollar appreciation, they will net take positions in the U.S. financial market. And when they do so, if this is going up, then that's going to cause the dollar to appreciate, which is down. So down, up, down. They expect the down, and guess what they got? Down. That's because they're the market. All right. And we're not talking about one individual dealer. We're talking about the aggregate expectations in the market. If they expect an appreciation, they take positions based on that. And in order to take a position in the U.S. financial market, you have to buy dollars. So in buying dollars, they drive up the value of the dollar, which of course is going down over here because that's um, fewer dollars per pound. I'm sorry I beat that into the ground, but, but, but my experience in this class is that that's something that's easy to forget, that all of a sudden students will be like, this is going up as an appreciation of the dollar. So I try to beat it into the ground so that every time you come around to looking at that ratio, you too force yourself to say, Oh yeah, fewer dollars per FX is actually a dollar appreciation. Why didn't I do the whole book like this? With FX per dollar? It was going to cause a problem somewhere, right? So uh, I, I decided to go this way. I did think about that. Okay, so we're almost done. The forecast is going to lead to the outcome. Uh, not, not at all surprising. If, if the market in general believes that Walmart stock is going to appreciate, guess what? People are going to buy Walmart and Walmart stock is going to appreciate. If the market in general believes that the dollar is going to appreciate, they're going to go out and buy the dollar in order to position themselves in the financial market, and the dollar is going to go up. Right? So, uh, what fed into that forecast is back here. I got two more interesting things to add over here. Remember when we talked about the bandwagon effect? Um, the bandwagon effect is that you'll get people who aren't even convinced by this part back here that 
uh, the dollar is going to appreciate. But when it starts going up, they're like, we ought to get on that deal. Because if the dollar's doing this, and I can jump on right here, as long as I jump off before it gets there, once it falls, I've made some money. So I'm thinking, yeah, I'm not entirely sure why it's going up, but let's jump on that bandwagon and make some money. So how do I show that on here? Well, I'm glad I asked that question uh, because now what I'm going to show you is, and let's see, I'll have to make this kind of tight. Um, band wagon purchases of U.S. assets. Is that what I got there, John? Yeah. Oh, black for the arrows. Wish I had a better black pen. Um, okay, uh, those are, let's see now. If the dollar is appreciating, which is going down like this, right? If the dollar is appreciating, I'm thinking, man, I ought to get in on that. We ought to buy some of those U.S. You know, treasury bills or whatever it is that we're using to position ourselves to take advantage of the appreciation of the dollar. So when this goes down, that goes up. When this goes down, fumble! When this goes down, damn it, I knelt on my uh, cord. Uh, when this goes down, that's a dollar appreciation, so I'm buying some more of those U.S. financial assets. And if I'm buying more U.S. financial assets, aha, our second plus sign, those bandwagon purchases of U.S. financial assets are going to be contributing to that overall net portfolio investment in the United States. So all this is pointing out is that there's also a feedback loop over here that's a positive feedback loop. If this is going up, that's going down. If that's going down, that's going up. If that's going up, that's going up again. All right? Um, and we see this a number of times in the market. Again, as I go over the last third of the course and talk about the history of the dollar, there'll be a number of times when, for all intents and purposes, these things no longer indicate that it should be going the direction it's going, but it keeps on going for a couple of months. And the dealers themselves will comment, um, I don't really know what's going on. I guess it's bandwagon effect. Um, and, and the irony is that they're the ones causing it. All right? So uh, I don't know what the hell's going on. Uh, I'm doing it. You know, or not, if not you, then your colleagues all around the planet are doing it. Um, and so I wanted to put that in there. That was a lesson from exam one, how, how bandwagon effects worked. And now the very last item to add on here, uh, and this is some really neat stuff to talk about, and that's technical analysis. See, technical analysis by dollar signals. All right, I'm going to put this over here. Ah, it would help if I spelled technical correctly. Tech Nicole analysis by dollar signals. Okay. Uh, let me go ahead and draw the arrows in, and let, then let me explain that afterwards. Uh, my arrow might stray a bit outside, but it's going to be like this. Okay, so this arrow is coming down from the actual exchange rate to technical analysis by dollar signals, and then from there to the forecast. This is going to affect the forecast. Um, what time is it? All right, let's see here. Okay, the, these are trading rules. And another interesting area of research that uh, there were a, a number of, of mainstream economists who said, well, there's no way. Trading rules can't possibly work. Trading rules are, um, what you do is, you, you, look at, you look at the at the past pattern of the currency price. Uh, yeah, I'll use this. Here's over time, here's the dollar per you know pound or whatever. And you plug into a computer those movements. And then the computer tells you where it's gonna go next, all right? And uh, the argument was, especially back in the 80s, um, that, well, this can't possibly be profitable because everyone has this information. 
This is publicly available information, so if it's publicly available, it's useless. What you need is private information that could be consistently profitable. You might get lucky, but it can't be consistently profitable. It's consistently profitable. Um, the most simple trading rule is simply a moving average. This is something else I learned from that Schulmeister article. Man, he had this all laid out so nicely. Uh, and then I ended up using it in some empirical tests of my own, and it all worked really well. So that Schulmeister stuff really helped me out. Let's see, three day versus, I don't know, 10 day. What you do is, it's so easy. You plug into the computer, I want the three day average of the dollar Deutsche Mark. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, there is no Deutsche Mark. Uh, the um, dollar euro, okay? And I want you, computer, to compare that to the 10 day average. And so, so there's some overlap there, note. Uh, here's your 10 day average. Can you see that? Yeah. And here's your three day average. So these three days are common, those seven are not. Right. So you are looking at the average of those two. And, and here's what you're telling the computer to do. Tell me when the three day is above the 10 day. Tell me when the three day rises above the 10 day because that's a trend. It's breaking out. It's like your, your last exam score was higher than your exam average so far in the class. Aha, now you're creating a trend here and we're betting that your next one goes up too. Um, likewise, if it goes the opposite direction, the opposite uh, uh, decision-making rule. So uh, you, you set this up to where whenever the three-day average is above the 10-day average, that's a buy signal for whatever currency we're looking at here. Whenever the three-day average is below the 10-day average, that's a sell signal. Now there are much more sophisticated trading rules, but they all really pretty much just boil down to this. And that is, are the most recent observations significantly different from the previous set, all right? Because think what has to be true for the 10 day includes those three days. Think what has to be true for these three days to be a higher average. It's really gonna be breaking out. Now, there's actually no reason on the surface of it to believe that, yeah, so what? Just because it came out you know, higher recently doesn't mean it's gonna continue to do that. But the trading rule works pretty well, all right? And, uh, now, now, this is a place where I thought that the neoclassical did some really nice research. Apparently, uh, I mean, sorry, especially a guy named Mark Taylor. He interviewed a whole bunch of, he was in London, of, of London currency dealers. And back before Brexit, that was the financial capital of the world. Good Lord knows what it'll be the capital of now. Uh, but um, the, uh, he interviewed a bunch of dealers and he said, look, we need to stop this arguing over whether or not people would actually use trading rules uh, within neoclassical economics because many people were saying, well, why would you do this? Yeah, that that, that um, it's publicly available information. He says, they do. Everybody uses it. Everybody uses trading. It's so simple to plug in the computer. Why wouldn't you use it? He said, but the degree to which they rely on it is very different from dealer to dealer. Furthermore, uh, people tend to lean more heavily on this for very short-term movements. They're not gonna use this to figure out where the euro's going next month, all right? They're using this to figure out next month. Uh, this is gonna be a very short-term thing with, you know, even interdaily. I mean, you could do this the last three hours and the last 10 hours if you wanted to. There's no reason why it has to be days. Uh, so he said, look, everybody uses it. Schulmeister showed it to be consistently profitable. Everything I've ever tested shows it to be consistently profitable. You gotta have a crap load of money though. You can't be doing, I'm going to do $100 in foreign currency. Well, $100, geez, the, the difference between the price at which they're going to sell to you and the price from wh at which they're going to buy from you is so big, you're going to have to make an absolute killing to cover just the transaction cost. But if you're a major bank and we're dealing with millions of dollars back and forth here, well, then the spread gets a lot smaller and you can do that. All right. Also, uh, well, anyway, that, that's a whole trading thing. All right. So, well, what about that? Since everybody uses it, shouldn't it be in there somewhere? Well, heck yeah. Now, that's going to be what? Negative, negative? Yeah. Ugh. Negative, which I hope showed up. Yeah, I can see it right there. 
and negative. And notice I've got this going into the forecast. This one I had going straight into buying uh, financial assets. This one's going to, because the technical analysis is, is rightly thought of as part of the forecast. It's independent of this part over here, but it's, it's rightly thought of as part of the forecast. So if the dollar is appreciating, now think about this. What would generate consistent buy signals? An appreciating currency because the average of the last three is going to keep um, tending to be bigger than the average of the last ten. When something's appreciating and, and, and for a long period of time, then you're going to tend to get uh, buy signals. Right? So, when this goes up, you get more buy signals. And when you get more buy signals, you figure it's going up again. So we have another positive feedback loop over here. Let me show you that again. If this is going, uh, I'm sorry, if the, if, if the dollar is appreciating, that's generating buy signals. And if you're getting buy signals, you're thinking, ah, I'm going to buy the dollar because the dollar is going to appreciate. So both of those loops on the right over there end up creating positive feedback loops. Great stuff. Great stuff. Um, okay. That's almost everything for exam two. Uh, not nearly as much material in one sense, but then it's also a lot more technical stuff. The next thing is going to be about financial crises. Uh, but um, that's it. That's the mental model. That's, that's our model of, how, of, of what's going through the heads of currency dealers when they make trades. Thank you.